Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 19, and we're going to be taking a look at a character that may or may not be familiar to you, kind of depending on, on how, how long you've been around the Bible. We're in this series called The, the Way of Hospitality, where we're checking out the idea that there is a lifestyle of hospitality, and then there's events of hospitality. So hospitality is not just um, a Saturday during the crawfish boil. Hospitality is a way of living. It's actually uh, like a way of being. And uh, this to us meets us directly where we are in our two-year vision. Vision 2020 is based on uh, this passage that Jesus promises that we're going to do um, not just the things that he did, but greater things than he did. And we're believing that that means we're going to see a ton of people come to faith in Christ, simply put. And, and so uh, we spent a ton of, uh, a ton of weeks on, on this idea that if that's going to happen, we're going to need another person. And we looked at the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is the great evangelist who actually saves people and renews people and regenerates their hearts. And so what does it mean to engage the Holy Spirit as he does like this, this amazing work of leading people to Jesus? That was the first aspect of the new culture that we're looking for that would support a vision of seeing the amount of Christ followers double like over the next two to, to even five years. And, and the second aspect in this culture is, is thinking about, well, it's not, it can't just be a culture of expectation. There has to be a culture of hospitality as well. Like when you look at the life of Jesus, this guy was radically hospitable, and he used his hospitality to invite people to himself. So if that was true of Jesus, that must be true for us as well. And so we're in week two of a series that will end on Easter, uh, where we're looking at hospitality. And what a great day, what a great invite day, if you will, to end a series uh, on hospitality at Easter. And, and so um, these are some of the cultural shifts that we're looking at. So these messages that I preach, they're not just random. They're not just things that, hey, we think are going to be uh, relevant to us today. They are, they are intimately specific to Vision 2020 and what we believe in our hearts God is doing in our midst. And so as you receive these messages, please don't receive them as simply students. People who came to maybe be entertained or, or check out a church. I mean, if, if you're new here, it's okay that you kind of have some curiosity. But man, it would be my prayer that you receive these as, as like um, marching instructions. Like, like, this is where God is taking us. And, and I'm not, you don't have to entertain me. You don't have to even, like, wow me with education. But, I, but like, we want to we wanna be trained and equipped in how God wants to bring about this revival in our midst. And so that's kind of the nature of, of these messages. And, and so we look at hospitality, and, and we've, we've been working through this last week. And uh, the, last week we saw that, that um, there's a kingdom pattern to hospitality. Jesus said the kingdom is in your midst. And we said, well, well, we mapped that out, and it looks like four, four sort of uh, themes, if you will. Loving people, knowing people, speaking to people, and doing life with people. And they, and they uh, oftentimes happen in that order, especially when you're intentional about it. And that's, people ask me to, to talk about the Avenue Church and kind of some of the, our history and how we have loved the city, because the reputation of the Avenue Church is, like, I step into things, and I'm like— if you only, like, knew me and, like, it's not, but, but I get asked and I come and I share and it's like people uh, want to know how is it that God has done this, like, major impact in our region through the Little Avenue Church. And, here, and I get to tell them it's love, no speak to. That's just what it is. And it's on repeat. It's, it's how God's kingdom broke in and it's how we do relationship with the city and one another. And we love people, which means we go to where they are first, actually in proximity. Then we know people. We ask questions. We engage in their story. Then we speak gospel truths that invite people to the person of Jesus. Then we commit to doing life with one another, no matter how messy it gets. And so last week, we, we looked, about, we looked on, on what it means to love people and, and where that comes from. And, and this week, we're going to transition. and We're kind of in between loving people and knowing people. Um, and we're going to be talking about a guy named Zacchaeus. If you know Zacchaeus, um, he, he's going to be he's going to be sort of our, our case study today. Um, uh, before we get there to kind of set things up, we always want to start in, in uh, a weekend hotspot for many of you, the Ritz Carlton. Can we see a picture of where many of you vacation? You probably um, you need to get back to your brunch there, so I'm going to make it quick. Let's see what time I got. Okay, cool. So last week we talked about the Ritz Carlton, and they have a credo, and we're thinking, man, we should probably learn 
from, from one of the, I looked up uh, on this particular, I think it was maybe Forbes or something website about like most hospitable hotels, the Ritz-Carlton Montreal came up and we looked at their credo last week. Well, this week we're looking at three steps of service for the Ritz. Here they are, a warm and sincere greeting. Um, use the guest's name, uh, anticipation and fulfillment of each guest's needs. That's kind of like one. Uh, that, that's actually two, and this is, this is the last one. A fond farewell. Give a warm goodbye and use the guest's name. So we've got a, a warm and sincere greeting. Uh, we have people using the guest's name in anticipation of, of what their needs might be. And then we have a fond farewell, giving a warm goodbye, using the guest's name again. Again. So according to the, one of the most successful hotels in the world, the use of a name is pretty radically powerful. Keep that in mind. There was a, a, the church that planted us was planted and started by a man named David Nicholas. And one of the things that David Nicholas was known for, besides sharing the gospel every week, which is probably why you hear the gospel every week here, he knew people's names after the first time he met them. Like, he was so intentional about not only knowing your name, but the name of your family, so that when you came back to church that second or third time, it wasn't just like, hey, good to see you, man. Hey, what's up, buddy? You know what that's code for, right? <laughs> like, I should know your name, but I don't. So, what's up, my brother? And, and that just wasn't the case for David. He just was so intentional about being like, oh... Hi, Dwayne. Hi, Rachel. It's good to see you guys again. Like the second time he saw them after he would see a ton of people all the time. It seems like in Luke 19, uh, we, we're getting to see the kingdom pattern move from loving people to, to knowing people. This is, this is kind of the way the, the kingdom works, as we said. And so um, Jesus is talking about, if you don't know what the kingdom of God is, just to give you context, it's the rule and reign of God that Jesus broke into humanity in a really specific and beautiful way, and it's been growing. The church is actually an outpost of the kingdom of God. So if you want to know what the kingdom of God looks like, you, you can check out the church. And how cool is it that we're moving towards this? Because that's what the kingdom is going to look like one day. It's actually a cosmic thing that's coming and going to renew all things one day. And we, we're like the appetizers for it. We're like the, we're the previews for what's to come. And so um, Jesus loves to talk about the kingdom, and he did it a ton. And in Luke 19, he then uh, models a kingdom value. So if you have your Bibles, that's where we'll be. Uh, if not, you can follow along behind me. He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in statute. Now, I don't know about you, but if I need to be remembered for one or two things biblically, I hope it's not like my scrawniness. You know, like in redemptive history, it's like, there's this guy named Casey. He was super scrawny, but God still used him for some cool things. I mean, because that, that's, that's where he starts off with Zacchaeus. It's interesting. Maybe we'll see why here in just a minute. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. On account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in statue. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him. If those of you who grew up in the church, the, the song is probably running through your head right now, right? Okay? If not, you're like, what, just, what are you talking about, scrawny man? Just keep reading. If, if, you, if, you, if you've been around the church for a while, that song has just been triggered. For, for he, Jesus, was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also 
is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The reading of God's word. It seems as though Jesus in this passage gives us a new way of seeing. A new way of seeing especially as it pertains to hospitality. My wife has the most beautiful eyes I have ever seen. I mean, I I don't know the correct terminology. I'm not like the the writer of the Song of Songs who's able to describe things in really, like, beautiful ways. I was thinking about this this morning with the Lord, and this is the best I came up with, that they are, um, they are, uh, how did it go? Something like captivatingly hazel. I don't know if ha- the color hazel and captivatingly go together. All I know is that sometimes when she talks, I'll want to stop the conversation or I'll just like, it'll just trigger in my mind like, your eyes are amazing. <laughs> like, I love them. They're intoxicating. I'm, I'm like, there, there's something about your eyes that are actually super messed up. Because as much as they are beautiful on the outside, they actually don't work really well. My wife can't see super good. You don't ever want to drive with my wife at night because things get messed up and, and like um, she just recently went to the eye doctor and, and got some new things and I was really confused because he's like, uh, he was telling her, well, the thing that I gave you last time, one eye is good like out there and the other eye is good in here. And, and like that, if you think about it, it can make you dizzy. It's like, what are you talking about? One eye out there, one eye out there. And so he adjusted her her, her vision so that I just drove with her the other night and it was awesome. It was like Mrs. Uber. It was so super cool. And not only was she beautiful in her eyes, they were captivatingly hazel, but they also worked. It was like she had this new vision. I think some of us, myself included, when it comes to hospitality, we look good on the outside, but we don't see right. It's like we need the Holy Spirit to come in and give us an adjustment which is like my prayer for today. So, so what, about, what about Jesus in this passage of hospitality? Well, a couple of things. You have an outline there, and, and, and we'll be working through it. Um, he looked up. He looked up. All these things come from this particular passage. It says that he, that he looked up. Um, Jesus was trying... I'm sorry, Zacchaeus was trying to see Jesus, but the center of the passage is actually that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Jesus, spirit-filled, he's got the kingdom agenda on his heart. He's got people to heal and feed. He has a ton of teaching. He's actually nearing the end of his life where he's going to go to a cross and where your sin and my sin will be placed upon him and he will receive the wrath from a holy God that will be poured out upon him directly for us, for the forgiveness of our sin. He'll overcome our our sin, he'll overcome our death, and he'll offer us that forgiveness through faith and repentance. It's not a given It's not a universal thing. It's a thing that needs to be applied through faith and repentance. And so if you're here today and you've understood yourself to be a sinner in need of a Savior and you've said, I'm turning from this life outside of Christ to this life with Christ and Christ alone, by faith you are made perfect in Christ. What's true of him is applied to you. Jesus was about to accomplish that cosmic event and he looks up. He looks up. He wasn't too busy. He wasn't too slammed. He wasn't too important to stop on his way through Jericho to look up. It's interesting when we think of our own schedules and we think of hospitality and think of what that might cost us. It seems like one of the first prices within the hospitality market is the pace at which you live affording you the opportunity to see people. Like really see people. 
Because we see from the narrative here that he not only looks up, but then he calls to Zacchaeus. He calls to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus translated as pure one, but that's uh, super far from where he was. Zacchaeus was not um, the pure one. Uh, in order, this is how the passage describes him, as a chief tax collector, as rich, as seeking to see who Jesus was, and as short. Those are the descriptors that we get of Zacchaeus. This is what it screams in this context and in that culture. Unloved, unclean, and unwanted. To take it even a step further, I don't think hated is too strong a word for the way that most people felt about Zacchaeus. One of the commentators I was reading said it may have even been the first time in a long time when he heard his name used in a tone of love and affirmation. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. I don't know who you are today. I don't know what you're bringing in, but I prayed that God would bring us the Zacchaeus of our city and of our region. And I'm hoping that you hear Jesus whispering your name in love and affirmation, inviting you to what he's accomplished on your behalf. Why was he hated? What was, what was the deal about Zacchaeus that made him so hated? Well, he was the chief tax collector, which means he was in charge of all the sellouts, whatever you know, branding you want to use. He was the guy, so normal tax collector would participate in a, it wasn't an occupation, but it was a practice called tax farming. Tax farming is when if taxes were $100, the, the tax collector would come by and, and charge you $130 and pocket the 30 and pay to the government the 100. It was a very common practice. So he was the chief tax collector and he also knew better. He was Jewish. He understood like at least a moral compass of the Ten Commandments and, and what it means to treat people right. And, and, and so, so Zacchaeus had this title and this lifestyle which put him in direct opposition and even hatred from the people that he was like supposed to care for. He was one of them and he was painfully taking advantage of his own. Tax farming. Unloved unwanted, unclean. I paused here as I was kind of like working through this and I thought like, interesting, who's attracted to you? I don't, I don't mean in like a sort of romantic, relational way. Hopefully your spouses and your, you know, girlfriends or boyfriends or maybe even soon to be girlfriends and boyfriends. This is, this is quite a marrying church. That's all I have to say. Oh, I have to say a few hellos online. Um, we've got some babies out there. Uh, baby Paisley, hey, Baby Paisley. Can we all just turn to the camera and wave? Hey, Baby Paisley. Um, hey, Baby Henry. And then, uh, and then Lily, who's not a baby, but she's, she's suffering with cancer right now. Lily, we're trusting that the Lord is going to do a great work in your life, and we're even believing for healing for you, and, uh, and we're trusting God's best for you. So, Jesus... In his, in his way, in only the way that he can, he seems to attract the wrong crowd. Have you ever noticed that? If you're building a team or you're building a business and Jesus is like your front man recruiter, he's getting the wrong people. It made me wonder, who's attracted to you? Like, who feels incredibly welcome around you? Is it other religious elites? It's not maybe a bad thing. Maybe they want to learn from your knowledge. Maybe they want to like grow in, in uh, their, their understanding of Jesus. And you have this beautiful understanding of Jesus. And so like maybe, maybe there's some, some really good things that are happening there. But what about like, um, I don't know, people who are far from God? What about people who are far from God and know it? Do they feel like they have a welcome place around you and around your family? As you look around at the people who influence you, as you look around at the people who want to be with you, as you look around at the people who feel welcome because of your way of hospitality, who is in your circle? Jesus had Zacchaeus in his circle because of who Jesus was. 
And Jesus doesn't disappoint here. If you're, if you're a basketball fan, this is your time. It's March Madness, and you're always rooting for the underdog. That's like a Jesus thing. He always picks the underdog. It's actually like a Bible thing. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Uh, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Just You can go ahead and slip up your hand if you can relate to any of these descriptions. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world. That's me, to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world, I get in, to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And Jesus starts with a name, Zacchaeus. And then he invites him. Now you might think that Jesus invited himself over. Have, have you ever had that person who invites himself over and you're like, okay, ah, yes. You know, like, you don't really want it. You're not, it's, it's kind of like that person who's, who's the, a, a little bit pushy, a little bit in your face. Well, that's obviously not the response that Zacchaeus gives Jesus because there was something different going on here. Although it looks like Jesus is inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house, he's actually inviting Zacchaeus into relationship and back to himself. He just needs to go where Zacchaeus is before he can do that. Love, know, speak, do. Zacchaeus, here's the deal. You've got to come down right now. I'm coming to your house next week. So you can prepare, you can make it all clean, and you can get it right and impress me when I come. That's not what he says. He's like, Zacchaeus, you got to get down right now because I'm coming today. There's no preparation. I'm entering into your mess. I'm entering into all the stuff that you've stolen, all the ways that you've betrayed your people and others, all, all the, the cheating, lying, scheming things. I want a piece of you just as you are. So get down. I'm coming to your house today. I hope you heard that if you're far from God and you thought your house was too messy for Jesus to enter into it. He loves messy houses. He's famous for people just like you. I'm not talking around you. I'm talking to you right now because I prayed for you. Jesus is for you. That's what, that's what that means, you know. I'm coming to your house. What that means is, is, is I, I see you I know you, and I'm, I'm still radically for you. In this culture, to enter into someone's house to break bread was a, a hugely significant thing. It meant alliance. It meant relationship. It meant access to one another. And what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God is for the Zacchaeuses of the world, starting with me. Zacchaeus was a real living historical figure, but Zacchaeus is the one talking to you today. And until you realize that you are your own Zacchaeus and Jesus sees you and knows you and is for you in that midst, you're not going to have a heart of hospitality. Because it wrecked Zacchaeus' world so much so that he turned everything upside down and became a new person. That's what the hospitality of God does to us and then through us to others who have yet to meet that God. I know you. He wanted relationship and not audience. That's interesting when we think about some of the friends that we've engaged with or we're, we're going to talk here about some of our neighbors and things like that. Are you pursuing audience with those around you or relationship? Because all good things flow from relationship, not just audience. Well, what did Zacchaeus do? He hurried home. He received him joyfully. He gave up half his goods. He gave back to the poor. And he, this was not a show. This wasn't him trying to impress Jesus. This was him saying, Jesus, I can't believe you're in my home. And you want me. <laughs> Have you ever felt what it feels like to experience being unwanted? 
having, having a boundary put up to you that says you're really not welcome here? And at the same time, have you ever experienced what it means for somebody to actually fully, fully, fully know you and say, I'm still for you? Because those eyes that don't work super well on my wife, they, they were some of, the, some of the first eyes outside of my family that knew me fully and said, you're still mine. You're still mine. That's what Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus. And when, and when a person understands that about Christ, there's an actual change that happens. There's what's called repentance. The scripture says, repent and believe for the kingdom is near. And what that means is change, change your mind, change your heart, change your hands. Zacchaeus changed his mind about Jesus when he, when he saw that Jesus was willing to meet him where he is. It was, like, it was like he started thinking differently. Oh, Jesus is for me. I never thought about that. It, it changed his heart. He hurried down and he was like, this is amazing. This is awesome. He welcomed him joyfully and it changed his hands. He started giving away his stuff. His life looked different because of the hospitality of Jesus. Jesus pronounces that salvation has come to this house. He pronounces that this guy by faith, not by his works, but by the evidence of his works that shows his faith, that this guy actually gets me and salvation has come because salvation is all about Jesus and your reception of him by faith. While at the same time, others saw a situation that had gone too far. It says that the others grumbled and were like, Jesus, you're hanging out with sinners. Now, this wasn't just the religious elites. It says the others. So this is a broad category. It may have even included his disciples who was like, man, I'm not sure we should go in there. I'm not sure we should follow him this time. It seems like he's gone too far. I mean, this is, I can't even say his name. It's, you know, Zacchaeus. Like, I, if I go there, then people are going to think I'm with Zacchaeus, and that's going to cost me dearly. Jesus goes too far with you as well and with me. We love to sing about reckless love, don't we? So we got two different things kind of going on here. At the, at the foundation of it was the way the Spirit filled Jesus, the heart of the Father filled Jesus, but practically speaking was the way that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Because at the end of the passage, he says he also is the son of Abraham. Jesus didn't see what everyone else saw and stop there. He saw what everyone else saw and he decided to see a son. He decided to see someone who had infinite value to God because he was created in his image, because he was part of what God was doing. Jesus actually doesn't say it in the passage, so I'm going to be very careful in saying this authoritatively. So I'll say it seems like, or at least the passage could lend itself to, this idea of Jesus seeing a reality in this man of being a real son of Abraham by faith before it became true. What if we started seeing people like that? Rather than my annoying neighbor six doors down or five doors down or... Th what if we started seeing people as people with infinite value and worth to the God that we love? We started seeing the potential of what the gospel could do in their lives before it became a reality, and we entered into hospitality that way. And so uh, a culture of hospitality, man, well, what would that look like? We would have to answer this question, how does Jesus see like this? He's pretty clear. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus rehearses his true loves. He rehearses his true loves. If you're looking for the blank there, it's he rehearses. In this passage, we see, yes, it's the, it's the Spirit of God that fills Jesus and his love for the Father. But one of the things that helps him to see like this is he rehearses, not just in this passage, but other pl passages, why he's here and what he's here to do. Jesus does not have mission creep. He doesn't lose focus on what's important. He actually rehearses his two true loves, his love of the Father and his love for people. 
And in the rehearsal, it's like Jesus' heart is continually prepared to see people like this. But the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So a culture of hospitality, what does a culture of hospitality do? A culture of hospitality sees. A culture of hospitality sees. It was almost... four years ago to the day that um, I know the the band hey Matt the band's going to come out pretty soon I'm just going to ask you guys to hold just for a second then I'll call you out thanks Um, it was almost four years ago uh, coming up to today that there was this little boy that entered our life through foster care and we his name his name is is Cade and we had the opportunity of seeing Cade in two different ways. We could have, because it was foster care, we could have seen Cade as a, a temporary glorified babysitting situation. Like somebody we were going to take pretty good, you know, as best care of as we can, but we're getting ready to give him back, and so there's natural barriers that go along with that. We didn't know what would happen with Cade. We didn't know that we would actually get to officially one day call him our son, which we did this year, but we chose, both my wife and I, to see him as our son before that became a reality. And I want to tell you that changed, that changed the environment of our family because of how we decided to see Cade as a son before he really was one. Man, as God's people who go out and practice this type of hospitality, I just want to encourage you to ask God to give you a vision for others that only he can produce as we move forward in hospitality. We said that hospitality is defined as preparing for the other. So the way that we prepare to see people like this is the same way that Jesus prepared, by rehearsing our two true loves, by rehearsing the gospel message that God loves us just as he loves Zacchaeus and that he loves the Zacchaeus next to us and behind us and surrounding us. And we rehearse that over and over and over again, and you're reminded that it's not your performance, it's his, and that it's not how you're doing, it's how he did, and that it's not what you bring to the table, it's the fact that he chose to see you as a son or a daughter before that was a reality, and he acted on your behalf. And so when you hear songs like Reckless Love and you you hear songs that talk about how God pursues us no matter what the cost, those are things that actually prepare our hearts to see others the way that God does. So I would encourage you in preparation this week. The question that we've been ending with every week is what does this look like in our AC homes and our neighborhoods? You can't have what's true out there if it's not true in here. And so I would encourage you to start with a name. So here's what we're going to do, because there's power in a name. You ever notice that? You'll be listening to me talk. It's like, wah, blah, blah, tell a story. Okay, I'm back in, blah, blah. I know. We do this together, so I I know what it's like. But things kind of change, right? When I'm like, look out there, and I'm saying, hey, what's up, Mike? Elsa? You guys know Cade? You're part of that story. I just changed the dynamic for them. It's like I see you. It's like I know you. It's like I'm for you. I'm just going to give you guys, like, literally, literally two minutes. We're going to practice. You have two minutes to find somebody in this congregation that you don't know their name, ask them their name, and tell them yours, and we're going to come back. If you should know their name and you're embarrassed, then just apologize. Be like, yo, I should know your name by now. I'm super sorry. Go. Now you've got less than two minutes. Go. (laughs) May I ask you your name, please? Vera? Vera. Vera. V-E-R-A. Vera. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I'm Casey.
All right. All right. Here we go. All right, so this is where we end, guys. This is where we end. I met uh, Vieira. Did I say it right? Where did Vieira go? Vera. Just Vera. See? I, I'm still learning. It's okay. It's cool, right? Like, I have Grace, right? Vera. But you know what? Now, when Vera comes back, it's going to be like, hey, there's Vera. And there's Casey. No, Vera's like, like I see Vera. She matters to me. And I'm going to communicate that exponentially next week when she comes back. I'm like, Vera, what's up? It's not going to be weird. It's not going to be creepy. It's going to be part of the way that God's family functions because we know there's power in a name. And so as we go out today, um, you have these here, right here. These are like little magnets. They're just helpful pieces. We've been following some of the exercises in this book called The Art of Neighboring. Uh, we asked you to, to do a prayer walk around your neighborhoods last week. This week, this little house in the middle is you. This little house in the middle is you. Um, this week, your assignment, if you will, as we practice this way of hospitality, is to put a name into all the other houses of the neighbors that surround you. You might already know all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those neighbors. You might know half of them. You might, it doesn't matter. You got a week to know them all, okay? So, so however you're going to do that, However, like, you know, we're going to try to dial down the awkwardness, okay? You can just kind of think creatively, ask God to help you. Like, we're going to enter in and be like, I've lived with, next to you for four years. I should know your name. I'm super sorry. I'm Casey. This is my wife, Catherine. Can you tell? It's okay. It's okay. Remember, Zacchaeus, I got to come to your house today. We got to start with a name, guys. And so I'm asking you this week, let's fill these out. Let's understand the power of knowing a name and being able to say, I see you, I'm for you, I value you. And we'll come back next week and continue to seek the Lord in this. Let's stand for prayer. I'm going to ask the team to come out. And uh, our prayer partners are going to come forward. If you have a need for prayer, we would love to pray with you and, and for you. And so we do this every week. Um, We'll be dismissed after this prayer, but uh, our, our prayer partners will be down here, and we'll have some music behind you just to kind of keep our, keep our context here um, worshipful. Father, thank you for uh, this time. Thank you for your spirit of hospitality. Father, I pray if there is a, is a Zacchaeus among us, that he or she might recognize that you have entered their home, that you see them, that you are for them, and that you desire relationship with them, and all that's required of them is to receive you joyfully by turning from their sin, their, their, their self, their former life, and saying no more life without you, Jesus. I believe you died for me. I believe you overcame my sin and death. And I want to walk with you now. I receive you joyfully. Lord, send us out with that mentality. We worship you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Love you guys.